the cloud. Yay. All right. Um, I will let people in as they come to our session. So don't you worry about them at all. Just pay attention to Paul and everything that he has to teach you. In the chat box, I'll put some information that you will need and you'll probably see it over and over again because those that join after I put it in can't see it. So um, we want to make sure that um, you can uh, see it. I did enable transcription of the meeting, uh, whether or not that works, not really sure. So um, try it, please try it and let me know. Um, I Authority for all of that is like way, way, way above my pay grade, not nest, nest, nest. And yeah, so here I am. <laughs> Keep in mind, I work for the state and the county and uh, lots of government red tape. Anyway. Paul is our guest speaker, and he is going to talk to us about the background checks. Now, Paul has been with us for a long time, and he has spoken on very uh, many different topics for our job seekers. But background checks, pretty unique, because no one really addresses it. No one talks about it, and it could make or break your hiring decision. And you should really know what employers are learning about you and what is included in background checks, especially um, when we're talking about 2021, 2022, and not 1985, because things have changed a little bit. Paul is an expert. He is an author. He's a career coach. He just started his own networking group. I mean, he's like all over the place. I don't even know when he sleeps because I don't think he sleeps, you know. <laughs> he's definitely um, a great person to listen to and get advice from. He talks about job search buddies. He specializes in biotech, pharmaceutical careers, but he does a little bit of everything as well, right? So he has some private knowledge um, industry stuff. And then he has some government industry and he, he's kind of all over the place. So definitely listen to what Paul is saying. And I will put in the chat, if you would like to take a screenshot of any of the slides and take some notes on it, feel free to do so. And I will tell you how to do that in the chat. Okay. So let me turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I am really glad to, to be here again. Thank you for having me back. Uh, Christine. So I want to tell you folks a couple of things. Number one, this is a very, very information jam-packed presentation. Uh, so um, I've asked Christine to allow you to unmute yourselves when I ask for questions, which will be about every slide or two. And you can un unmute yourself and ask your question at that time. If you feel the need, go right ahead and type it in and Christine will interject it. Um, my fear though, is that we're gonna be moving relatively fast and the time it takes for you to type may be a slide or two after your question by the time we, we get to see it. So feel free to interject as, as it comes up. Um, you know, the agenda looks kind of short there with only four items on it until you look at number two that's got 11 pieces to it. So there, there's a lot to be seen here. And a couple of things you'll notice as we go through the presentation. The takeaways, everything you see in green on the screen is something that you can do now to help you in improving or correcting anything that you're concerned about within your background. Anything you see in red are the gotchas. They're the things that we need to be aware of and look out for as potential problems going forward. So watch for those two things. And then I do wanna just kind of say a couple of things about the, the presentation overall. Don't shoot the messenger here, okay? Uh, listen, I. I, I I know that this presentation can be very scary because we're going to talk about a lot of different ways that people are looking into your background and looking at all your skeletons in the closet. The truth of the matter is though, that most employers either cannot afford the time or cannot afford the money, the cost of doing all of these background checks. 
So they're really only doing what they need for the specific position that you're applying to. Now, the higher up in the organization you are, the more of a background check they're gonna do. If you're going for any kind of a security clearance, the more of a background check they're going to do. And what we're gonna look at are all of the possibilities of what they're going to do, not just what any one specific company does. So be aware that you're gonna see a lot of things, much of which will have absolutely no bearing on you, but you wanna be aware of it and know what people are looking at so that when it does come to you, you're prepared for it. If you've seen this presentation before, I've been doing it for about five or six years. And as Christine said, I'm pretty much the only one I know of that is doing this presentation. The last two years have seen a lot of changes and a lot of things that I've updated. Um, so you'll see things that are pretty current as it relates to COVID, as it relates to marijuana use in New Jersey. Um, and that's the other thing I should mention is that as I'm presenting it today, the information is based on New Jersey, New Jersey law, federal law. It's not necessarily based on law outside of the state of New Jersey. Um, but where I know of some differences or things that are, are typical outside of New Jersey, I'll make you aware of those as well. I just want you to know that if you do live outside of New Jersey, you probably want to check your own state laws on some of the issues. So to get us started, here you see the what seven organizations within the federal government that have some jurisdiction over background checks. The predominant two are the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Both of those places and in their laws and regulations within really govern most of what is legally bound by background checks or in background checks. FERPA, the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act has some issues. Um, HIPAA, the, the health, I always get the name of this one wrong, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, um, the um, Federal Trade Commission, they all have some impact. The American with Disabilities Act and all of its updates through uh, July of 2021 have some impact. And the newest player in this game is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was a new government branch uh, or division that was started under Obama. Um, so, there, there are other places, but really the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the EEOC are the two places that have the most impact on a federal level. If you need to get information and it's difficult for you to find it within one of those organizations or within your state organizations, contact the ACLU. They tend to be a great resource to get information and to share information on how to find out what's happening in your background check or or what the laws say around your background check. Questions so far? No questions, but I'm tired. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, like all those agencies are involved in background checks. You think it's so simple and it's like so much more complex than any of us are led to believe. Yes, yes, you're right. And yet it is very simple. Because when you look at what really predominates what is allowed or not allowed within a background check, it really comes down to the policy of your previous employer. With a very few exceptions, and I'll go into those later in the presentation, there, the law does not prevent me as the employer looking to hire you from asking anything I want. I can pretty much ask anyone, anything, and there's no restrictions on that. There are a couple, but the policy of the company that you left, that's where the roadblocks, that's where the walls, the restrictions come into play. And most of you are probably familiar that most company policies say that only the human resources department can provide information about a past employee. And in most cases, 
the HR department has an, a policy that says all they will do is an employment verification, which we'll talk about later on. So the, the restrictions come into play from the people that are being asked to provide information, not the people asking for information. Additionally, more and more- Can you say that one more time? Yeah, I know. It can be confusing, Erica. So, so the, the policies of the company that you left, your previous employer, that's where the restrictions lie as to what information that employer will say about you to me, the hiring employer. Okay, so I can ask whatever I want if I'm looking to hire you. Only the, restrict, the restrictions only come in from your past employer and what they are willing to allow their employees to say about you. And more and more, probably, you know, I would give it a ballpark number, 75 or 80%, maybe even more of employers today will only provide an employment verification. They won't provide any additional information. Why? Um, well, we'll talk about that when we get to the employment verifications, okay. but, but that's a great question, Christine, and I'll, I'll get there. Um, quick answer, liability. Liability, yes. And, and that's why more and more employers, even as the employer looking to hire you, I'm going to hire a third party to do the background investigation because yes. I don't want to be held liable for information about you. That's true. So, so more and more employers are not even doing the background check themselves. What they're doing is basically saying, background check company, here's my list of requirements. You go do the background check. And all I want you to do is come back and say, do they meet my requirements or not? And if they don't meet my requirements, then I'm gonna turn the person over to you. You guys figure it out, make sure the information is true and real, and then come back and tell me if that person's background is now acceptable to my requirements. Yes. And at that point, I will consider hiring you. Of course, that takes a lot of time. Yes. And I may not be willing to wait that time mm -hmm. to keep that position open for you. So I may just move on to the next candidate and hire the next person on my list rather than wait for you. Right. So that's why we want to look at what our employer is learning and what can we do today to make sure that what they find out is not going to stop the employment process or stop yes. the offer process. Yes. Okay. Oftentimes, headhunters, part of their role in staffing agencies is to try and find those problems before it gets to the employer. So more and more headhunters are doing some kind of background checks before they offer you up as a client, a candidate for the role. The biggest thing that you want to take away from this slide, though, really, believe it or not, is that bottom line green read the fine print on those online applications that you're doing. Here's the issue that most people don't recognize. In that fine print, you are oftentimes giving the employer permission to do a background check before they've even decided whether or not they wanna interview you. You've already given them permission to delve into your background. So, Know what it is you're saying yes to when you submit that electronic application. And personally, as a career coach, my guidance to my clients is, I don't wanna fill out an application until you're ready to make me an offer because there's no information on that application that's probably not already on my resume you need in order to make that decision. So I wanna network into the opportunity I want to be talking to that hiring manager long before I'm filling out an application. And when I get to the point of the application, that's just to get through the formal interview process, but the decision's already been made, they're going to hire me. Know what you're saying yes to before you submit that application. Paul, in that, in that regard, um, I've wondered a few times when I, I see that I'm in an applicant tracking system because you'll see some of the same names come up. So 
if there are any blanket sort of permissions that are being requested that I may be less aware of, does that is that job specific or is it platform specific? Um, if Somebody. it's a good if it's a good platform, they're doing it specific to the employer. But there probably are some general things that every employer wants that they've already included just in the platform. The platform can be modified by any company yeah. to include extras. And yeah. so just because somebody uses uh, iSIMS, iSIMS might not be the same across the board. It really does go on company, as Paul stated. So whatever the company has set as the line in the sand of what they will and won't talk about, um, it's company to company, not platform to platform. Yep. So social security numbers. And here's the bottom line with the social security number. Don't give it out. There are only two legal times when an employer or when anyone is allowed to ask for your social security number, according to the federal government. And those times are when you are involved in something financial and when that financial information is to be reported to the government, right? So when you're being put on payroll, they're gonna take out taxes. They need your social security number, right? When they're doing a background check, oftentimes if they're especially doing a criminal background check and some other aspects, they're going to want your social security number as an added way of ensuring that they get the information on the correct individual so to, to prevent some false positive uh, hits coming through. But really, the only people required to ask for it are people who are reporting financial information to the government, which means, for example, all of my doctors that I've been to in the last three years have been asking me not only for my social security number, but a copy of my driver's license, which in New Jersey has your social so security number embedded in your driver's license number. So no, I'm not giving that to you. You have no right to that information. You have no need for that information, right? So just don't give the information out if you can avoid it. Um, Paul, I just wanna make sure that uh, people know there are old outdated ATS systems that routinely ask for this yes. and other information that Paul will address. And um, it's, yeah, we're telling you what is legal and what's not legal and what to do and what not to do. But ultimately, if you can't go further without entering that information, it's up to you to decide. Oh, for Christine, yourself, get out of my head. <laughs> uh, whether you want to go forward or not, it's not up to us. That's so, right. You know, please know that uh, Paul is giving you really, really good advice, but he's not a lawyer and he's not going to sue the company. Um, so you need to know what is legal and what's not legal and make that choice yourself. And, and I want to also just add to that, um, you know, Christine alluded to this, but this is uh, important enough to really make it very clear. Anytime you say no to giving an employer information, you're raising a red flag to them to say, do I want to hire you? And so know that when you don't give your social security or you don't give your driver's license, or you don't get, give whatever information they're asking for, that's just another reason for them to say no to hiring you. Now, the question becomes how comfortable and confident are you that that employer will properly store and utilize that information to prevent it from getting into the hands of people who shouldn't have it, right? So what are their, their um, security protections in their online systems? What's the quality of the people that they hire, specifically in HR, but in general, who have access to that information? How secure is that information being uh, held within the company's offices? Who has access to it? And, and that can open up a lot of scary thoughts. And I can tell you from doing this presentation, for example, that one woman told me, 
in three separate companies over seven years, she had an HR person, I'm sorry, Christine. It's okay. Properly, improperly utilize her inf information and ended up stealing her identity and opening up hundreds of thousands of dollars in credit. In it wasn't name. me, but. <laughs> no, right? So, so how reputable is the employer that you're dealing with? And, and then you decide, is this job so important and so perfect that I'm willing to give up this information even if I think they may not handle it properly, right? Or do I believe this company is so reputable and so good that they are going to take care of the information properly, which is probably by the way, about 98%, 99% of the companies. Right? Or do I have enough concern that I'm willing to give up this job by not providing them the information that they're asking for? And by the way, email is not secure. So if you have a recruiter contacting you about a job, asking you for your social or your passport number or anything like that, um, anybody can hack email very, very easily. So yeah. that is not a secure method of passing that on to a recruiter for a job that you're interested in. And um, I talk about these in my workshops. It's very enlightening. And, and just having Paul echo exactly what I would say is a huge help. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions real quick on this? Because I want to keep moving now. We do have a few questions, um, but I'm not sure if they pertain to your slides. I applied for two jobs with uh, Citigroup, two different departments, and one was in Connecticut, the other in Manhattan. I gave the name of my boss in Connecticut. That's where I'm from. Um, what can an internal reference within Citigroup say about me? I don't okay, know. Yes, so that was, me. that was my question. Yes. All right, Anil, remember that question. Come back to it when we get towards the end of the presentation, talking about verifications in particular, but also touching on reference checks. Okay. All right. Next. Any others, Christine? Uh, no, just comments. Thank you for the information. Huge. Okay. So here are the 11 different types of reference checks and background checks that we're going to start talking about. We're going to go through them in order from the left column down and then the right column. So uh, again, just as I did with Anil, I may ask you to hold off on a question until we get to that piece in the presentation. Let's start with the criminal history. Typically, they're going to go back about seven years. Um, however, a conviction will likely show up for the rest of your life. So um, they're, they're tr primarily looking to see what has happened in the last seven or so years. But if there is a conviction, it's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. Can They're I make a comment on that? Yeah. Um, it does go back around seven years. And uh, I just found out about six months ago that even if you expunge your record and wipe it clean, some companies have access to finding out that you expunged it and it doesn't matter. So um, if you think you're in a clear, you might not be depending on what that uh, conviction was. So it's definitely something to address um, at the end of, you know, right before background check with a potential. Right. And, and I'm, I'm always a proponent of once you have an offer, better for you to share your skeleton yourself before yes. they find it themselves, before yes. they find it in the background check. Yes. But so, so where are they going to look? They're, they're generally going to go to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Federal Sex Offender Registry. They will almost always go to the State Bureau of Investigation. And oftentimes, especially here in New Jersey, because the court system is actually about a year behind in entering data, they will go to the county and local police department and typically they're going to go to all of those organizations for every state and every locale where you worked or lived during that background check period of seven plus years. Right. So if you've moved around a lot yes. and have a lot of different home addresses, they're going to probably look at a lot of different police departments. If you've worked in a lot of different towns over the last seven or eight years, you probably are going to have them look at a lot of different towns and counties. Okay. 
There is a big difference between doing an internet background check versus a fingerprint background check as it pertains to criminal history in particular. And typically when they're doing an internet background check, that's where mistaken identity issues tend to arise. Because your fingerprints are pretty much individual and there's no question who is who. But do you want to be subjected to a fingerprint? That's up to you because once you give your fingerprints to the government, they are on file and they will remain on file for the rest of eternity, truthfully. Yeah. Um, so even though you're a law-abiding citizen, whoever went to be, you know, background check to be a substitute teacher and you provided your fingerprints, well, those fingerprints are now on file with the federal government. Um, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. It's just something to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Here's an example of an issue that happened with an internet background check that caused mistaken identity. This was about 10 years ago, almost 15 years ago, uh, where someone in Worcester, Mass, applied for a position, was given an offer, they did the background check. The background check came back that there was a serial killer with this individual's name <laughs> who was supposed to be in jail. The company thought they were looking at hiring this serial killer. Turns out that the serial killer and this candidate had the same first and last name, the same middle initial, and the same birthday, both of them born in Worcester, Mass. So their social security numbers were pretty similar as well, right? So only minor differences in their basic background information. It took this gentleman two years and ultimately a letter from the Massachusetts Attorney General to say that he was not the serial killer and that the serial killer was in fact still behind bars in federal penitentiary. And so this guy is in the clear from a criminal record. Do you think the employer waited two years to get that information? Right. So be aware that these things can take place. Again, it's unlikely, but it's possible. So as Christine alluded to, if you're not sure about what is in your background, go to your lawyer or your local police department and ask them to pull your criminal history report and provide it to you. Um, the, the police are probably going to charge you somewhere around $50 or so to do it. Your lawyer is probably going to charge you an hour's time to do it. But if you have anything in your background, and if is the only reason to do this, if you have something in your background, or if you know your name is so close to someone else's, then you might want to have your background check run. It's unlikely to be necessary in most cases. When they do a criminal background check, here's what they're looking for. The results are going to come back as saying one of three things, complete or clear which means there is no issue, or findings, which means there is an issue. If they have findings, it might provide the additional information of the jurisdiction where the finding was held, what charges that were uh, found, and or what punishments if it's been adjudicated. In the findings, if it says you were guilty, charged, or pending, that's going to be a problem. If there's a bench warrant, that could be a problem. And I want to speak specifically to bench warrant for this reason. Please don't raise your hand. I don't want to know, but I'm going to ask this question. <gasps> Who has not paid a parking ticket in your life? Because if you have any tickets that you have not paid, it is highly likely there is a bench warrant for your arrest in that jurisdiction where that ticket was written. And when I do a criminal history check, it's going to show on your criminal history. And now that stupid five or $10 parking ticket from 20 years ago could be the reason you don't get a job. So please don't ignore those tickets, get them taken care of. So are you saying that a criminal history check, when you go through all this checking for that, is, is, is different 
then a check that you would get um, from Expedia or any of those credit agencies? That's a credit ch history check, not a criminal history check. So yes, um, they are different. Thank you. Yep. So um, New Jersey recently passed the law, which I think is a good thing in the end, that prohibits an employer from asking about your criminal history prior to the point of making you a job offer. So for example, applications should no longer ask you about your criminal history. And the reason behind this law is that because so many people now have some type of a criminal record, oftentimes for very small, minor misdemeanor drug charges that are preventing people from getting jobs. The state said, you know what, we're just not going to allow people, the employers to ask about that until they're ready to make an offer. Because now you've had a chance to prove yourself, to show your value, and to convince them that you're the right person for the job. And then the two of you can talk about what this minor issue in your background was, and hopefully that will allow you to still get employed. But as Christine said earlier, I do recommend if you think you have something in your criminal history that could be preventing you from getting a job, work to get it expunged. Yes, employers may still find, may still may, find out about may, it. May, remember everything extra is money, extra. All of this stuff is yes. extra. So um, if they don't have the money, it's a smaller company, you know, limited resources, uh, yeah, you take this step because you never know. And, and if you think you need to do it, don't wait another day, do it now. And part of the reason why I say that is because as the marijuana laws are changing and drug laws are changing to take the smaller misdemeanor offenses from the 70s, 80s and 90s and remove them from um, being you know, illegal today, right? So that, that getting caught with one joint in your hand is no longer an issue in, in New Jersey, right? Those records still need to be expunged if yes. you were arrested way back when for that. Yes. And so the number of people looking to have expungements is on the rise. And the time it's taking for the courts to get through that expungement besides just dealing with the slowdown because of COVID is dramatically increasing the time it will take for your record to be expunged. So the sooner you do it, the better. Right now, it's gonna take at least a year, probably longer. And whether you file the records yourself, which you're allowed to do, or you have your lawyer do it, it's likely gonna cost you about $1,000. There's actually not a whole lot more that a lawyer is charging over the cost of the, the court fees to get this done. So just get it done. I suggest you have a lawyer do it if you can. This way, you know it's being done right the first time, and they'll possibly be able to help get it through the system more easily. Um, whereas if you do it and you make one mistake in the form, then you're going to have to start all over again, and it can be a pain in the neck. So, a lot of churches um, in Monmouth County, anyway, have uh, lawyers that volunteer their time. I don't know of any that are coming up, but um, you could call around and see. They'll, they'll do it pro bono. Any questions on criminal history check at this point? Okay, so you're driving. About, about move to a social credit score system, um, like it's online, similar to CCP in China. Say that again. Are you familiar with a credit score system similar to the CCP in China? Let's hold off on credit okay. questions because I have a whole okay. couple of slides on credit. No problem. Thank All you. Right. Yep. So driving history. Both your driving record and your credit record fall into this category where the myth is if you're irresponsible as a driver, you're probably going to be an irresponsible employee. Psychologically, that's been proven false. But emotionally, as, in, as humans, we believe that statement to be true. So employers have been doing driver history checks. 
I'm actually learning more and more are dropping that requirement because they're realizing that it's been a waste of money and they don't want to spend the money on it, right? Typically, they're going to look back only about three years. They may go back a little bit farther, but generally, your driving history is only going to show the last three years, with one exception. If you got a ticket, let's say five years ago, you could say 10, but it doesn't matter. You get a ticket, let's say five years ago. That ticket remains on your driving history for three years. If in that three year period of time, you receive no additional driving tickets, then that ticket drops off your license. But let's say five years ago, you got that ticket. And then three years ago, you got another ticket. Now that new ticket is gonna stay on your license for three more years, but so is the ticket from the two years prior. The five-year-old ticket is going to stay on your license as well. Let's go another two years. So last year, you got a ticket. Now all three of those tickets are going to stay on your license until you have three consecutive years with no driving record. Then all of them will drop off at that point, okay? So the moral of the story is, of course, don't ever get a driving ticket to begin with, but if you do get one, be really careful to be driver clean, no tickets for at least three full years. The other thing you wanna be aware of with your driving history is we're looking at your DMV or C MVC driving record and the points on your driver's license. Those are different than the points on your insurance policy. For example, I could have a clean driving record where I've never gotten a ticket, but last year I was in an accident. So, Motor vehicle is going to show that I have no tickets, no points, because in the accident, a ticket wasn't written for me. But my insurance company is going to have assigned points to my insurance policy based on how much they've had to pay out for that claim. So it's a whole different point system. It takes into account all of the stuff on your driver's record, your driver's license, tickets you've received, plus anything that they've had to pay a claim on that did not show up as a point on your driver's record. Okay, so we're only looking at the driver's record. We're not looking at the insurance points when we do this background check of a driver's history. That's very interesting. Um, th there's jobs that I've gotten in at Mom County and they say a, a driving history uh, background check is required and they're going to do one. So they kind of give you a heads up, um, but there are four driving positions where um, yes. you are a, a direct support professional and you have to drive clients to doctor's appointments or you're a CDL driver and right. all of that stuff. Um, but this is new as far as the three to five years and five years ago, carries over to the three and, and so forth and so on. So you might only have one ticket, but yet you really have three tickets because of that. So that's very interesting. Thank you. And, and as you said, Christine, more and more, if you are not going to be doing driving for the company, whether it's in the company's car or your own car, but you're not doing driving on company time, that the likelihood is they're not going to be doing the driver history check anymore, but they may. Can Erica, you get a driving check from a uh, motor vehicle or do you yes. request yes. it? Is there a fee? Yes, so, so good question. And then I'll get to Erica's. Um, okay. You can go to either your insurance carrier or the motor vehicle, motor vehicle commission to get your driving history. The best time to do it with your insurance carrier is about the time of your policy renewal, because at that time they are pulling it from the MVC themselves. And oftentimes, if you ask, they will provide you a copy. They may charge you for the, the service, but sometimes they won't.
Okay. The motor motor vehicle commission, you can go in there anytime and ask them for it. I think actually now because of COVID, you can do almost all of this online, um, but you can okay. request it from motor vehicle and they will charge. I believe their current charge is between 15 and $20 per uh, license that's being okay. checked. Thank you. Erica, your question. Yes, you, you mentioned points on insurance and points on your driving record. That's a little bit confusing. At, at first, I thought maybe the points on your insurance were just your, your tickets and what the company has had to pay out. But then you referred again to points on your driver's license. So is a ticket a point? So every moving violation where you receive a ticket from a police officer has a point value assigned to it. And when you pay that ticket, you are admitting guilt to that. And those points are being placed on your motor vehicle commission driver's license record. Your insurance company will base your insurance rate on the points they learn about from motor vehicle commission, plus any points that they've assigned based on claims that they have had to pay out. So when the tickets drop off after three years of no tickets, do the points drop off too? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you're in an accident and no ticket was given to you because you were not wrong, but the insurance paid out money. You'll have insurance whatever, points. Then you get points on you'll have, your insurance. You'll have insurance points in that case, yes. but you won't have motor vehicle points. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Any other questions here? Not yet. Nope. Got okay. It. And I see two people in the waiting room, Christine. Uh, same um, person. Yeah. Okay. Got All it. right. So let's look at your military record for just a second. And this is one of the newer ones that I hadn't uh, realized was being looked at. Um, basically, if you were in the military, an employer wants to see that you have either a general or an honorable discharge. If you have less than a general discharge, that would be a dishonorable discharge primarily, then they may hold that against you in hiring. However, for the most part, if you have a general or an honorable discharge, employers are going to want to hire you because they receive credit from the state and the feds for hiring veterans. Right? So they're oftentimes, it's a value to you to inform an employer that you are a veteran. The key here is this. If you've been in the military, whether or not you've been, no, no matter how you've been discharged, if you're in the military or were in the military, you must keep a personal copy of your DD-214. That is your, for those of you who don't know, that is the, the primary form that maintains your record of military service. You want to have veterans at least two or three copies of that. And you probably want to keep one in a safe deposit box or in a fire strong box somewhere where it will be safe no matter what happens. The reason for this is simple. Back in the late 80s, the primary records depot for the United States military, the Department of Defense in St. Louis, had a massive fire. And they lost somewhere around 75 to 80% of the records of all military service members from that date back to the beginning of time in the 1700s. With that, those records gone, there was no proof for someone of their military service. Now, fortunately with computer backups, blah, blah, it's less likely today, but why take the chance? Get a copy of your DD-214, keep it in a safe place so you have access to it when you need it, in particular when you're looking for using it with an employer or some other places. Questions on military records? As, nope. a, general, as a general rule, your military history is not going to hurt you in a, a background check unless you did not receive a general or honorable discharge. So let's go to those credit questions now. Just as I said before, your credit history, if you're irresponsible with your money, you're likely to be irresponsible with my money is what the employer thinks. And of all of the background checks um, that 
Paul went through in the very beginning, the credit history is the most expensive. So therefore, unless you're dealing with money on a regular basis, um, that is probably one of the first things to go out the window because yeah. it doesn't pertain to you. It However, to any finance, any accounting, any white collar crime potential, any retail where you're counting, you know, cash in the cash register, you might be subject to this. So pay attention. So, so um, as Christine said, it used to be a very common report or background check that was done was your credit history. It's becoming much less common these days. There are some things we need to be aware of. First off, you can and should be getting a free copy of your credit report from the reporting agencies directly rather than through another source. Now, I know I've got Credit Karma and Money Tips and Free Credit Report. Hell, even my bank to these days is supposedly giving me my credit score. But oftentimes the score you're getting or the report you're getting from those places is truncated. It's shortened. It's not the complete the full thing and certainly the score you get is oftentimes a score that they give to the consumer which is a different number than what they give to a creditor i don't understand why the difference but they do so you want to go directly to the three primary credit reporting agencies by new jersey law i heard a rumor i haven't verified that it's now federal law the credit reporting agencies are required to give you a copy of your credit report at no cost once per year. I'm somewhat simple-minded at times. So every year in February or March, when I submit my taxes to the government, that's also my reminder to go poll the three credit agencies and get my credit report. So I can see at least once a year what's on there. I have a lot of clients who have said to me, they go and get one every four months. So they'll go to Experian, let's say in, in April, and then in August, they'll go to Equifax, and then in December, they'll go to TransUnion. By doing that, they're getting three separate snapshots at three different times of the year into their credit to give them a better picture of who is accessing their credit and when. And if something is awry, they have the chance of correcting it or fixing, stopping the issue, you know, of three months, six months, 12 months faster than I am because I'm only looking once per year. Yes. So, so it's worth it to look at it multiple times. But again, you can only get it once per, once per agency for free every year. So um, now, many of them will give it to you more often if you want to buy it. They'll you know, pay them and they'll give it to you whenever you want. Um, but it's not necessarily worth it to do that. The thing is, you want to know what is on your credit history, because that will tell you who is accessing your information and give you a glimpse into what they're doing with it. Um, one of these women who had her uh, identity stolen said to me that in one case, somebody went and bought a $250,000 house using her credit history. And now she was held responsible for that loan when they defaulted on it. And ultimately, unless or until they could arrest the person who did that and then get that person to actually pay restitution, she ended up having to pay for that house that she never owned, lived in, or knew where even it was. So we want to know what's happening there. Take the steps as soon as possible to correct, fix those credit issues that you find in your credit report. And, you know, most credit cards are actually getting really good and most banks are getting really good at determining whether or not something is potentially fraud and questioning you before they make those payments or certainly if it's a small credit charge right after that payment, and then they're putting a stop on that payment so you're not held responsible for it. But know what is on your credit report and take the steps to fix it. Quite often, let me just double check, yeah, quite often um, you'll hear people talk about 
putting a freeze on their credit history. There is certainly value to that. And I would tell you, go to your accountant or your financial advisor to determine whether or not it's appropriate for you to have a credit freeze put on your credit history. What that does is it prevents anyone from accessing your credit without your permission. The downside to this is when you're in job search, you don't know if or when an employer is going to do a credit history check. And so when they go to do that check and they get stopped, that could be enough reason for them to say, I just got to move on because I don't have time to deal with this. So when you're getting the offer and you're finding out or providing information that you need to give to the employer for the background check, ask them, what specific background checks are they going to do? And when do they intend on doing it? So that you can then contact the credit agencies and say, I give permission for this employer or this employer's vendor to have access to my credit and unfreeze your credit. Here's the other piece you just be, need to be aware of. On one side of that transaction, either the freezing of your credit or the opening of your credit, the credit agency is gonna charge you to do it. Again, the charge is around 15 or $20, it's not huge, but you know if you have four or five or six companies wanting to access your credit and you're opening and freezing your credit that many times, you know, it's $100 out of your pocket. So just be aware that the, the right best thing that I'm hearing from almost every accountant, put the freeze on your credit. But no, when you go to Macy's this uh, Christmas to open a new credit card, they're not going to be able to open it for you because your credit is frozen. When you go to an employer, it may cause a delay in your offer because of uh, having to get that credit opened up for them to access. Questions Question. on credit history. Does each credit reporting agency have the same information on them? Like Experian, Equifax, TransUnion? Is it the same, just different companies my, or what? My experience has been that they're about 95% the same but there is some information that sometimes shows up on one and not the others. So it is good to get all three and compare them and see what the differences are. Just so you know, my identity was stolen and my credit is frozen. Mm -hmm. So um, this is uh, something that is so routine and it can happen to anybody for any reason. And you just need to be aware um, Paul is not trying to scare you. He's just being a realist. So exactly. um, I don't want you to leave this webinar being, oh my God, I'm never coming back to Monmouth County again. All they do is scare you, scare tactics. That's not the case. It's just a realistic something to think about um, as he's addressing all these issues potentially that could affect you. And it's good to bring that up again, especially since so many people joined us after I, I gave that warning at the front mm -hmm. as well. So let me just uh, touch on identity theft a little bit more. The good news is cybersecurity has become such a hot issue. By the way, anyone who wants to get into that field, it's a great time to get into that field. But cybersecurity has become such an issue that in 2021, by mid-year, the number of breaches and the number of records that were breached had actually dropped by more than 20% from the year before. So, or uh, no, I'm sorry, um, it's 20% more than last year, but 60% less than uh, 1990, uh, 2019, I believe. I've got you guys covering half of my slides and that's, yeah. Um, so, so the good news is we're getting better at it and fewer and fewer people are having their data breached. Here's the bad news. In 2019, over 18 billion data records were illegally accessed or stolen. There are only 7 billion people in the world. 
So the probability is very good that your data has been breached. The question is how much data? Who has it? So the other good news is that when a company does have their data breached, it's become standard policy almost anymore that for anyone whose data was breached, that company will uh, pay for, you know, Identity Guard, ID Shield, Trusted ID, LifeLock, one of those companies for a year of service to ensure that you have access to know who's checking into your credit or who's getting access to your identity during that period of time. It's a one more way of just making you aware of what the problems are when they occur. The downside to that though is, so I've stolen your data. I can sit on it for three, five, 10, 20 years. How often does your date of birth change? How often does your social security number change? How often does your maiden name change? How often does those personally identifiable statistics and data about you change? The answer is next to never, right? So just because your data was stolen this year doesn't mean five years from now it won't get used. So know that at this point, for the most part, pretty much all of us have had our data stolen. It's a question of when and if it's going to be used and who's going to do it and how they're going to use it. So here are some things that you should do to help protect your identity. First off, again, always go to your lawyers and your financial advisors for the guidance of the current best practices. I used to hate my employers that would have me change my password every 30 days because I could not remember the new damn password. Right? But the more often you change your passwords, the more difficult it is for hackers to get into your information. So change the passwords. I like to use a password manager. My family, we use lastpass.com, but there are a bunch of them out there. The way these work is you enter into that password manager, the URL, your ID, and your password. It gets stored in a blockchain methodology, which is a fancy way of saying they take all the pieces and they throw it out and scatter it in all hundreds of places so that no one piece of information is in any one location. And then when you want to access that website, you open up LastPass or whatever manager you're using, you say, ent you know, enter that password or that uh, website, it will go and open the website and autofill your ID and your password. And then you just have to click open um, or log in and you get access to that website. LastPass happens to be the password manager used by the National Security Agency. I kind of think that's a pretty good bellwether to say, maybe I should use them too. Well, um, Michael uses it, so it must be good, right, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> but but, but you utilize some type of a password manager. It, it helps tremendously. I don't know about you. I've got about four or 500 websites now that have asked me to sign in and log in, and I can't keep track of all of those damn things. Um, another thing that I like to do with my passwords to help it make it easier for me to remember them is I create a password phrase. And the password phrase is a little more difficult for a hacker to identify and for computer programs to, to you know, churn through and find. So you might use, just as an example, my password is a number, a special character, and the name of the website. So for example, and this is not my phrase because I use this example all the time. My password is the first letter of each of those words, M for my, P for password, I for S or for is, number one, exclamation point, last pass. Now I can remember my password is one 
exclamation point website name, right? So it makes it easy for me to remember all of my websites um, or passwords. So you might try doing something like that as another mnemonic for remembering your passwords. And then when you change it, my password is two exclamation point, last pass or whatever, right? So you can change it more frequently and it's not that difficult to remember. This was an interesting thing that I had learned. How many of us have been downloading all kinds of apps to our phone or to our tablets? And then we say, sure, track my location because I want to know what the weather is wherever I am instantaneously. Every time you allow a website or an app to track your location, that app is constantly running in the background of your phone so that whenever you do access it, it instantly knows where you are. So the strong recommendation from cybersecurity folks is any app that you're not using on a regular and consistent, almost daily basis, delete the damn thing. And then when you need it, you just reinstall it. Quick prime example, this summer I was, went uh, flying twice on vacation. So I downloaded the American Airlines app just before leaving my home to go to the airport. And then when I got to my destination, I deleted the app. When I went to check in for my trip home, I downloaded the app where I had good Wi-Fi. I checked in, I kept the app open or on my phone until I got home, I deleted the app. And I did it again for the next trip. There's no reason for me to keep the American Airlines app on my phone if I'm not going to be using it because I'm not planning on traveling until next year sometime, right? So just get rid of it. The fewer apps you have, the less access ha hackers have to your device. Um, I'll get to you in just a second, Erica. Um, this was another one, the regularly check your website security settings, which I thought was really interesting. Oftentimes, when a website comes up with a major update, they will ultimately end up setting your security back to factory reset. So, for example, if Facebook comes out with, you know, Facebook 15 or whatever Facebook they're up to. So known for this, by the way, just so you know. They'll, you'll say, yeah, give me the, the update. And now your settings have all gone back to factory security settings. So if you don't go in and reset the limits on who you want to access that website and that information, it's wide open to the world. So you want to make sure you keep doing that on a regular basis. Okay, Erica, your question. So do you know, especially with with the example that you used of um, the airline application, you know, I, I'm i really brutal when it comes to eliminating most apps on my phone, but even Good. though I don't use the, the travel one regularly, I do keep it on there, um, but I, I say no to most um, accesses yep. as, as a rule. So is that helpful, even if it's something that you don't use often, if you are... So, so again, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, Come but on, my, I know, but my experience and, and understanding is that the more you lock down your, your apps and your accesses to any of your information, the more secure it is. But in the end, get rid of the app if you're not using it. Any other questions here? We have a question on... Um in the chat box about uh, living in different addresses. Is that something that you're going to get to or is it kind of across ahead, a, a go, slide we go, already have? Yeah, go ahead and ask the question. I'm not sure. Um, due to unusual circumstances, I have had numerous addresses in the past few years, um, including at a state student, but didn't change my address on the driver's license because it was right, right. day, blah, blah, blah. Um, there were three different locales in seven years. Now the question, 
how do I determine which ones I need to list? Most were only temporary, like two months and, you know, um, they didn't okay. really affect my driver's license. So um, when they ask you on a um, application, is it safe to list according to where a vehicle was insured or the address for a bank account or what's if you receive, Yeah, if you received mail at an address, then the yeah. internet knows it and the employer can find out about it. And if you don't tell them and they find out, that's a red flag for them to question, why are you hiding that address from me? Okay. So um, when it comes to background checks, my experience is the more the better, whether or not it's good information, the more information, the better information. Because uh, again, I don't want you employer to find out about this on your own. I'd rather I'm telling you because then I can say, hey, listen, just so you know, in the past seven years, because I attended two different colleges and I had to move for these other reasons, you're gonna find five different addresses for me in seven years. Here are the addresses, you know, but there's a legitimate reason behind all of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so you wanna let people know. Thank you. Again, I don't give any of this information out until the time that they've made an offer and they're ready to do the background check. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So let's talk for a minute. Let me just make sure. Yep. Social media. And really, for the most part, I'm not so much concerned about the information you're putting in social media. I'm really more concerned about the information others are putting in social media. For example, if we just look at the September or the January 6th insurrection as, as just one example, most of the people who have been arrested were not arrested because they posted something on social media that says, hey, look at me, I was here. But most of them who got arrested were arrested because the government was watching the videos that other people posted and then were able to identify who was in that video. The, the, Olympic, um, the, the, the Olympian was one, I think it was Olympic swimmer, uh, you know, was one person who he didn't post anything as far as I know, but other people posted stuff that had video of him there and he was real easy to recognize and know who he was, so he got arrested, okay? My niece, when she was in her 20s, every party she went to, at least five people would post a picture of her drinking with her friends on Facebook. If you look at her Facebook account, you think she's a drunkard. <laughs> she didn't post those pictures. Other people did. But now as an employer looking at social media and seeing all of those pictures of her, it's going to cause me to question, what is her judgment? Is that someone that I want to hire? Right? So I don't really think, truthfully, you or I are going to post things that are probably going to be problematic. Um, of course, the exceptions are anything political and religious the, the, or sexual. Those are going to be issues for, for you if you post them. But I am concerned about what other people post. The hard part is if someone else has posted it, you can't take it down. You have to get them to remove it. However, somebody posted it, you get it removed, but you don't know that I took a screenshot of it. Now I've got it saved and I repost it at some other time. Hey, remember Christine 15 years ago when we did this and here's the picture of you. You never know when this information is going to come back. You never know how it's going to come back. So the best thing to do is just not to allow it in the first place. My husband and I foster kids and we are not allowed to post any pictures of the boys that are in our foster home. The boys can post pictures of themselves, but we can't post pictures of them. So whenever we go into a party or to an event with family and friends, 
we're constantly running around saying, you can take pictures, sure, but don't you dare put it online because we're going to get in trouble. You know? This is uh, very important because social media has definitely evolved. And this is a huge difference of how it used to be two years ago, let alone five years ago, let alone the last time you might have encountered a background check. Yep. And social media has definitely evolved and changed and morphed. And it is probably one of the most dangerous parts of your background check that you might not have considered. As Paul had mentioned, January 6th just like was detrimental to so many people who did not post. It used to be that if you were tagged in somebody's post, you could just untag yourself. Now you can't do that, such as screenshots and whatnot. So um, it's really important for you to be aware of who's doing what as far as taking video or pictures and how you're so, appearing. So here's here are your fixes. Number one, you can set up on Google and a variety of other places an alert with your name so that anytime something goes on the internet with your name, Google will make you aware of it. I now know that there are about 15 or 20 people in the United States that have the name Paul Sakala spelled the same way as mine. I thought I was pretty unique, but I guess not, All right? So do set up your Google alerts. Do a Google search of your own. Search not only your name, but search also images to see what you find. And then when you find stuff that is inappropriate, the best that you can do is go back to the initial post, you know, whoever initially posted the content and or the webmaster, but I dare you to get to a webmaster at Facebook or Google and ask them to remove the information. Very, very tough to get information removed. And even if it is, chances are somebody else has got it saved somewhere and it's gonna come back anyway. There are a lot of organizations, it's a growing business right now, where companies will try and improve your reputation online, right? Re reputation Defender, I think, is a common one. Really, all most of those companies are doing is flooding the internet with positive information about you so that the negative information gets pushed so far down in a Google search that Nobody sees it. The problem is once they stop putting all that good information in there about you, the bad information starts percolating back up to the top. Right? So we need to just be aware of what's out there, try and get it removed. More and more media outlets, you know, like NJ.com or, or the Star Ledger and other news or outlets have now a content removal um, page on their website where you can go and ask them to review content that has you listed in it and determine whether or not their editorial policy will allow them to remove that content from their website. And quite often they will, um, but that's the best that you're gonna be able to get done. Uh, Google has set up another place to do more privacy checks, myaccount.google.com data and personalization. It's a great place to go to check what um, what is being allowed to be posted about you and how you can try and lock down what is and is not being posted. Questions on, on social media? Not so far, we're good. All right, so let's look at drug testing for a second. It's becoming more and more popular. Um, and right now, according to Sherm, most companies, about 80% are still using urinalysis, but the use of hair follicle or saliva testing is increasing, especially as saliva testing is becoming more um, viable and more accurate. Typically, when a company is doing a drug test, they're looking for about 10 to 12 different drugs. And that number is gonna to continue to increase as more and more synthetic drugs enter the market. I remember back in 87, I think it was when I first went into the aviation industry and had my first corporate drug test done. We looked for four substances. Now again, we're up to 12. 
Some things you want to be aware of. First off, look at the ingredient list for all of those supplements that you're taking. It's not been as big of an issue in the news recently, but back in the 90s, you might remember hearing a lot about people having trouble with drug tests when they bought supplements from GNC designed for weight loss or muscle building because those supplements often included some type of inappropriate or illegal steroid. My mother-in-law, God love her, God rest her soul. She got a mail order master's degree in nutrition. And as far as she, could, she was concerned, nobody knew more about nutrition than her. She found some amazing product online that was guaranteed to extend your life by 50 years. And she started taking it at 72 years old. After two, three months, taking it as at the recommended dosage, she felt really good. So she started doubling the dose. And she started to feel better. So she tripled the dose. She still felt even better, but at the same time, she started turning blue. <laughs> oh my gosh. Turns out one of the ingredients not listed on the ingredient list colloidal silver. She wow. was being heavy metal poisoned yeah. because she was taking so much of this supplement. So you need to know what are in anything that you put in your mouth. You need to know those ingredients. And then just don't take stuff. If you don't know what's in it, don't take it. Okay. And most supplements by the way, are not FDA regulated. So you really don't know the efficacy of the, the supplement and or what's actually in it. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about marijuana use in just a second, but here's the bottom line with marijuana. Nobody has a clue what's gonna happen and how it's going to come down in the court system and what's gonna be considered legal and what's not legal. Remember that right now, at least, federal law differs from New Jersey law, which also differs from many corporate policies. And in the end, the corporate policy is probably going to be the most restrictive and therefore the one that's gonna be the problem for you. Now, if you happen to work for or are going to work for a federal company, it doesn't matter whether a contractor or the government, doesn't matter where in the country you are, you will be held to federal law. So since marijuana use is illegal under federal law, even though you live, work in New Jersey, but work for the government or work for a government contractor in New Jersey, where it's legal for you to have marijuana, you will not be allowed to use it because of your federal connection. Much like alcohol, this is where I, I believe this is where marijuana use is gonna come down in the end, just like alcohol. If the company doesn't want you doing it and they test for it, they're not going to hire you or they are going to have grounds by corporate policy to fire you for use. So, know what the company policies are. The court system still has to adjudicate what is going to be considered legal, what's going to be considered illegal, how the, the law as it was written is going to be interpreted. Who the hell knows what's going to happen with that? CREMA is the acronym for the law in New Jersey that governs cannabis use. One of the um, good pieces of that law is that other than federal government and federal contractors, New Jersey employers cannot discriminate against you if you have a marijuana background. So even if they do a drug test and they find marijuana in your system, they can't use that against you. 
if you have a marijuana conviction, they can't use that against you unless or until they can prove that that conviction or that usage would negatively impact your ability to perform the job. Please know, I'm going to interrupt you, Paul. I am a sure member. And one, this hasn't been taken to court yet. So That's therefore, right. nobody knows what the heck is going went on. <laughs> That's right. It could be how you interpret it. So um, you could be far left, you could be far right, you could be in the, it doesn't really much matter until the court decides and puts down a ruling, it's kind of up to the company. With that said, if you're working for a New Jersey outlet of a company, but they're headquartered in Missouri, you have to go by Missouri law, not New Jersey law. So that could also come into play depending on who you're working for and how many outlets they have. And maybe they're based in Germany and right. whatever Germany's law is or rule is, uh, is governing you. So there's a lot that comes into play and you need to do the research to know how it might affect yes. you as a potential employee. Yes, absolutely. The All good right. news, another good news here is that um, I believe at last count, it was somewhere around 17 or 18 states have now legalized marijuana use in those states. Um, and so I suspect that in the next decade, we'll see that it'll be legalized on a federal level um, because the momentum is going there. But we're, we're not there yet, right? So um, just know what your company policy is, know what your what laws govern your company and then know how they are going to react when something like this comes up. Um, you know, it pertains as well to medical marijuana, right? So even though you may have a medical marijuana card, again, using that example from Christine, if the, if the state of incorporation for the company does not allow marijuana use, your medical marijuana card means nothing for That's that right. employment. Yep. Okay. Questions on, on anything related to drug testing nope. um, or marijuana, anyone? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Let's take a quick look at medical records. Um, the bottom line here is an employer has no right to access your medical records unless it impacts your ability to perform the job or unless your medical history is important to your safety on the job. And I'll talk about that in just a second. First, let's talk about your ability, ability to perform the job. So that's why you've seen over the last 10 or 15 years, the questions on applications change from do you have any disability, you know, two, can you carry X number of pounds, Y feet, you know, or can you perform these tasks? And if your answer is no, you cannot perform these tasks, the employer has two options. One, just to pass over you as a candidate, or two, to ask you more about why you cannot perform those tasks, at which point you can then voluntarily provide them information about your disabilities so that they can decide whether or not they can make an appropriate accommodation for your disability and allow you to work there still. You know, common one for, for many desk people is, um, you know, because of my lower back issues and having slipped discs, I can't sit for eight hours. So I need to have an adjustable desk that allows me to stand. Well, that's a real easy thing for an employer to do, right? So if you tell them that, they can make that accommodation. However, I would not tell them until after I have a job offer. <laughs> you don't want to give out the information ahead of time, right? So um, some positions, especially if you're going for C-suite positions, they may require, the employer may require proof of your ability to be insured for life insurance. And that would be a reason for them to expect a physical exam and have access to your records. Um, 
the big one that's in the news today, and I'm going to talk more about it specifically as it relates to COVID in just a moment, is immunizations. And we have a long history in our country of requiring or allowing employers to have access to your immunization history in order to prove that you are not likely to get sick while in my employ at my facility because of the likely access to those diseases. Right, so that's a long, complicated statement, but let me let me kind of break it down for you. If you work in a school, or a healthcare setting, or any place now where you have high touch contact with the public, you are likely to be asked to show proof of immunization because it's protecting you from getting sick from all of those people you come in contact with. That's why we can allow it and we can require it as an employer. Um, now, um, uh, I think Erica had her hand up, but did she drop off accidentally? Okay, so. Um, I think she posted something in the chat. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Christine, can you see that quick? Yeah. What, what's her question? No, you don't have it. Uh, is there formal designation for disability? I have some complications from a knee. Um, and, and good, you just answered that. Okay. Yes, that's what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Your doctor okay. do must um, say that you are disabled. They have to yes. document it in your medical file, write you a note. And there's this whole thing that you have to go through. You can't just say that you're disabled. That's right. So they have to back you up and document it in your file. Hence, the, their ability to get access to some of your medical records yeah. when you need an ADA compliant accommodation. Okay. But uh, if there's no need for you to have an accommodation, or there is no reason for you to expect to get sick by being employed then the employer does not have the right to ask you for the information. An exception to this is worker comp claims because the employer is paying for that insurance, the employer can then access those, those claims to ensure that you are truly incapacitated in whatever way for however long um, and that they need to continue paying the short-term or long-term disability for your workers' complaint. So um, those are the places where people can ask about it. Now, uh, let's talk for a minute about COVID and then we'll come to questions. And the first thing you need to hear me say really, really clearly, holy crap, is this information changing every day? So what I've got here is current to the best of my knowledge, Definitely as of September, I believe that it's still current as of today, but you need to go and check with the, the government, the health department and others to make sure that things have not changed, okay? Now that most of the primary vaccinations have received their final approval from the FDA and they're no longer being used under an emergency approval it means that employers can now start asking for proof of vaccination or weekly testing in order for you to maintain employment. The most recent thing I heard about a week or so ago was that while President Biden has decreed through emergency order that any company with more than 100 employees must require all of those employees to be vaccinated or show proof of weekly testing. I believe there was a, a district court that has just put a stay on that so it does not take effect. But again, this information is changing daily. So you need to keep up with it if getting vaccinated is an issue for you. 
Paul, just so you know, two days ago, they took away and refused to extend that stay. So okay. back in play. So, so see and how- if you're remote working for a company, you still have to get the vaccine if that is a requirement for in the office as well. So just because you're remote doesn't um, exempt you from getting it. So again, the information is changing really, really fast. It and is. you have to it really is. keep up with it. Okay. So I apologize that this is not totally accurate. Yeah. But, but here's here's what I have to say a, a, about this. Um, first off, at the time of an offer, ask up front, what are your company policies? What are your company expectations? And then decide based on those policies, whether or not you want to accept the offer. I have a a client of mine from uh, another job search group who actually is currently working and his employer has decided, uh, actually back in July, that if you were to step foot on premises, you needed to be vaccinated. And depending on your department, about 50 to 60% of the employees are expected to be on premises at least two days a week. And what that HR department is doing is putting a pretty little green dot next to your picture on the company ID to signify that we have record of your vaccination and you are vaccinated. That can be seen as a violation of my medical records privacy because that green dot sets me apart from everyone else who is not vaccinated. Or or conversely, those who don't have the green dot could be the ones set apart. And so so it's a problem, right? And though this gentleman is fully vaccinated, he's even already had his booster. He has refused to allow them to put a green dot on his ID on principle of that's my medical records. No one has the right to know that information. So it's gonna be interesting to see if anyone in that company actually um, takes that to the EEOC or somewhere else for um, potential discrimination issue and see what happens with it. My expectation is that the the employee will win and that the employer is gonna be told they have to remove those green dots from everybody's ID. But who knows? We don't know yet what's gonna happen with that. So, Um, one of the the values of networking into a position, you can ask about those policies before you even interview or entertain a job with them, right? Find out what the company is doing up front before you even get there. But once you get an offer, now you need to know what their policies are. And so you need to ask that question in order for you to make the decision, do I want to work for this company or not? Okay. Knowledge is power. Absolutely. Questions? None so far. Okay, so nothing on medical records or COVID. All right. Professional licenses. More and more companies are actually looking to have you verify your professional licenses and certifications. So put them on your resume all you want. Remember, your resume is a marketing document, not a legal document. But if you list it on your application, you damn well better be current and accurate with the licenses and the certifications that you list. So don't lie, I love that, don't lie. (laughs) Yeah, and it's and it's true. And 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 I'll show you in education records another reason why not to lie. But companies are getting more and more savvy when it comes to having proof of your background information. So you may be asked to provide a copy of your certificate of that shows you've gotten the certification, right? And literally I have to do this because I just got it in the mail yesterday. Here's my certification as a global career development facilitator, right? But this certification is valid for three years. If I don't maintain my continuing education requirements, that certification is no longer valid. So if I don't do it and I list that certification five years from now, I'm lying. Yes. Don't lie. Yes. You need to be accurate. That doesn't mean, though, for example, 
that I put that on my application five years from now, even though I've not maintained it, but that I put the, the expiration date of 2024. So I've not lied. Yes, I did get this certification. And for three years, it was valid. It's no longer valid. Right? Now I'm not lying. But it shows that I have the body of knowledge that comes along with that certification. Mm -hmm. So put the information out there, but put the complete and accurate information, not just hide the pieces you don't want them to know. More and more, employers are going to be asking you to go back to the certifying body and have that organization send proof of your certification. So project managers in particular, this is an important thing because there are so many of you. Huge. Make sure that your PMP is current with PMI yes. so that when PMI is asked, they can say, yes, you are currently certified. In more cases than not, this along with almost everything else we've talked about, especially social media, HR is using this as a screening tool to remove you from the process. They're not using this information to bring you into the process. They're using it to get you out because I have so many applicants, I got to find ways to get rid of people and get it down to a manageable number. Questions here? No, no so, questions. I agree so, with uh, everything you said so far, especially that last slide. PMPs, I see that a lot as well. And so, I'm a PMP, by the way. Yes. So education records. It's another place where too many people have lied for too long, too much in the past. Shocks the hell out of me to think that 75% of people in a 2016 survey by Sherm said they lied on their application or on their resume. It's only going to come back and bite you in the butt. So don't do it. Today, most employers are expecting you to go back to the educational institution and have them forward directly to the employer an official copy of your transcript. And that means that it's addressed to the employer, that it's in a sealed envelope with the registrar's seal not broken, when they receive it in order to show proof that it's valid and excuse me that um that that uh, transcript has to actually say on it you graduated with this degree and there's usually a fee involved if it's sealed like that it's not like a photocopy so that's right um keep that in mind as well when you're talking about expenses that you might encounter that, that might be something that you have to consider. Another 10 to $20 fee, not, usually not much more than that. And more and more educational institutions are using a clearinghouse organization. So you don't even go directly to your school. Your school says, go talk to this organization. They collect the data, they collect the fees. Then they go to the school to get the record if they don't already have it on file. And then they send it out. It's ridiculous, but this is how it's happening today. And that includes schools that are no longer in business. Uh, we have gone and done background checks, can't find the educational institution. Somebody else bought those documents and those transcripts, and then we have to go there. If you have a high school diploma, say you did, but you got it in, I don't know, Guatemala, and the school in Guatemala burned down, somebody still has a copy that it can still be verified, but it takes longer. And that's why a background check might take longer. So you have all of these things that Paul addressed, and it depends on how easy it is to verify versus not verify. To so move Christine, forward. let's, let's take that example even closer to home. Yes. Yeah. Right now, over the last five years, Liberal arts colleges, especially small independent liberal arts co colleges, oftentimes referred to or known for history as teaching colleges mm -hmm. or nursing colleges. If they have not grown into a university status, 
they are all in financial trouble and starting to close. Or in the last 15 or 20 years, the parochial high school that you went to or religiously affiliated school you went to has closed. Mm -hmm. By federal law, education records are required to be maintained into perpetuity. The question though, as Christine put it, is where are those records for the school that's closed? And it could take two, three, five months to find those records. Literally just last month, a dear friend of mine moved from New Jersey to Florida and she is looking to get her New Jersey teaching license authorized in Florida. This is convoluted in a little bit of sense. It was really weird the way this happened. It's gonna take three months for her New Jersey license to get transferred to Florida, but it's simply a matter of New Jersey saying, here are all of our requirements. She meets all of our requirements. We have proof of all that documentation. So you can authorize her to teach in Florida because we have all those proofs, including for example, a college transcript for a college that closed. In the meantime, she wants to substitute teach. So she's got money coming in while she's waiting. And the substitute license should only take two or three weeks to obtain. However, she found out that the substitute license, because it's a different department within the Department of Education in Florida, oh is requiring that she go back to that closed school and get a fresh copy of that transcript sent to them so that they can see proof that she graduated from that school. Yeah. And it's going to take, she's gone back and checked and gotten found the right place. It's going to take a minimum of eight to 12 weeks for the organization that has those records to go research, find those records, get them copied off of the microfiche and then put it into paper, stamp and authorize it and mail it off. By the time that's done, she'll have her permanent teaching license. It's ridiculous. And it's so, important to know that every institution is different. And here you have an umbrella where yes. there's two organizations and one it's okay and one it's not okay. And it's not anybody's, I mean, I don't know who makes these rules. It's, it's that person, whoever made the rules. So, so you just have to follow what they're asking you. And um, sometimes that stinks. So here's one of my recommendations for this situation. Because more and more colleges and high schools are going to be closing over the next five, 10 years. I strongly recommend that you keep somewhat in touch with or aware of what's going on at the schools that you've attended. And when you find a school that is in jeopardy of closing, number one, reach out and find out who purchases that school or what happens to those records when they close. Number two, order five or six copies of your transcript and have it sent to you as an official copy, signed and sealed, pay for them. And then you've got them in hand so that when you go to the employer, you can say, look, the college closed down five years ago. I can probably go to the state and get a copy of the records. I don't know how long that's gonna take. Here's a sealed copy of my transcript that I got before they closed. See, it's still in the sealed envelope. Would you accept that? And chances are the HR department's gonna say, oh, thank God you made my life easy. Yes, we'll take it. Yes, right. absolutely. So have the copies on hand and ready for use. Just please, please do not open those envelopes because no. once you open it, it's no longer an official copy. That's right. If the school will not send it to you as an official signed copy, which some schools may not do that, you're welcome to, to have them send it to me. Tell me in advance, but you're welcome to have them send it to me as the employer. I'd be happy to do that. And then I will forward them to you so that you can get them that way. But again, make sure you tell me you're doing that so I know what to expect in my mail. Okay. <laughs> Questions on education records? No, getting, not yet. We're getting close to the end here, guys. So, so thank you for bearing with me for so long. 
Um, employment verification, you know, there's two things that, it, that I, as the company hiring you, will want to do as it pertains to your past employers. I'm going to want to get an employment verification and I may want to get an employment reference. There is a difference between the two. A reference is me talking to say your past supervisor or another employee and having a conversation with them about you to learn what I can and get as much information as I can. An employment verification is very simply providing officially from the employer the dates that you were employed and your title at the time of separation. Most employers will no longer give out any additional information because I'm gonna be held liable for giving out that information. So if I tell the employer that's looking to hire you that you were fired and why you were fired, I'm now held liable for the potential of you not getting a job. And I don't want you to sue me for that. So I'm not gonna tell them you were fired. Okay. In um, we were always allowed to ask, are they eligible for rehire? And that was a way to skirt around getting fired. And more and more employers are not even fired. answering that. <laughs> you know? um, the question in chat box earlier, I would like you to, I'm sorry, but please yeah, say that Anil. once again. Uh, make sure everyone is paying attention. There is a huge difference between employment verification and employment references. Can you yes. please go through that again, Paul? Yep, sure. And then we'll get to Anil's question. So in a reference check, I can ask, as the company looking to hire you, I can ask your reference anything I want. There is nothing that prevents me from asking a question that I want to ask. It's up to that employer or the employee at that past employer whether or not they can give me information. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. For example, as it says in the red bullet there, it is currently illegal in 19 states for, the, for me to ask what your salary history is prior to making you an offer. In some states, at the point of an offer, I can now ask you for your salary history or I can ask your employer for a past employer for that. But other than that, there really is no uh, limit on what I can ask an employer about you in a reference check. Reference check. Different. Most most employers are no longer doing reference checks. That is, most employers will not give out a reference for a past employee. So a they, reference is somebody that you worked with, somebody that you worked for, somebody that you worked alongside. It could be your best friend. Yes. It's a reference. It is not employment verification. Your right. old HR department, totally separate, unless you're very best friends with HR. And so, so the employment verification is very, very simply, what was your title at the date of separation and what were your dates of employment? Exactly. Now, the place where most people screw up with employment verifications if you were hired temp to hire, right? Or contract to hire. And the employer of record was the temp agency for that first three months or six months. Your start date with the company was when you started on their payroll, not on the temp agency's payroll. So people, sometimes put the wrong dates and now I go and verify it and I say, you lied because you put the wrong date down. I know of someone who worked in a company that I was working for. They had been there for 12 years as a model employee with one exception. We were on a sales team and this person routinely did $4 million a year in sales. Everyone else on the team did five to $6 million a year in sales. Finally, the employer said, if you can't come up to the 5 million or better in sales, we're going to get rid of you. And they coached and they mentored and they worked with him. They did everything they could. He still came in under $5 million after two years. They went back to his application and found where he and his dyslexia 
transposed numbers on the dates of one of his jobs. And that was enough information for them to say, you lied on your application, therefore we're, we're firing you 12 years after the fact. So you, you need to know what is being said and what is being done. Anil, what's your question? Well, my, my only question was, thank you. I found this very informative. Uh, 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 I really appreciate all the information. Uh, I was working uh, from October 2019 to May of this year at a contractor for City, uh, and they laid me off because apparently City had a, City Group had a policy that, and this was in Stanford, uh, so I was staying up there and coming back home on the weekends. But uh, keep the details minimal because for time right. purposes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So they, they they said after 18 months, and there was a city policy, they don't renew contracts for contractors. Okay, yep. fine. I didn't know that. So now I've got two applications out, and which I've interviewed for at Citigroup uh, for a different position uh, as a trader in Manhattan. So within the firm, is there any restrictions on what they can say or not say with, within the firm? Okay, great question. So, the, and there, the, this goes to a couple of different places, right? I'm friends with someone else at either your, at any of your past employers. And you're coming to work for me. As long as that person still works for the, the company, they are bound by that company's restrictions and policies. So whether or not, because it's internal to the company in your specific situation, the two bosses can converse with each other and, and you know, share information. I don't know that there would be any restrictions on that, but it would be wise for those bosses to go to HR and find out before they talk to each other. Okay, I appreciate that. Think... However, if it were another company, right, that's looking to get information, you know, now I'm a friend with somebody at the company you left. I can go talk to my friend and ask them whatever I want. However, that friend, if they're still employed by that company, is bound by that company's policy and really cannot give out information that would be considered reference information because then the company can be held liable for that conversation. Different situation. I'm currently working on a grant for the Morris County Workforce Development Board. The executive director of the board is a woman who was my boss when I worked at Morris County, uh, County College of Morris. I'm now looking at potentially working on a contract for another workforce development board. Can this ex boss of mine give reference information to the new workforce development board? And the answer is yes. And she can talk about my employment at County College of Morris because she's no longer employed by CCM. So CCM cannot be held liable for the information that she provides about my employment at CCM. She could be held liable for information she gives about me based on my employment for her now at the Workforce Development Board. So it can get very convoluted, right? The, the key is backdoor references are taking place. Nothing we can do about it. But boy, if you're the one giving information about a past employee, you want to be sure that you are not putting yourself or your employer in jeopardy when you do it. Because if you do, you're going to be out on the street just as quick as I was out there for giving information that you should not have been given. Okay, thank you. And let me jump on all of what Paul just said. I agree with you 100%, but do you think for one minute that I don't talk to other recruiters about you? Do you think that my friends aren't recruiters and HR or people that might know you? That's right. Just be nice. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Because you don't know how it's oh, going to come back to haunt you. You just right. don't know. And so 
if you're just nice and you don't, you know, burn any bridges, you got nothing to worry about, people. Right. <laughs> You'll so, be fine. <laughs> so, so, Christine, I want to just make everybody aware that I've got just a, two or three more slides. So we're probably going to go to about five or ten afternoon, and I just want you all to be aware of that. Okay. Okay. I, um, I just, I just want to say, interject one thing. Thank you very much. I appreciate the, the answer, Christine and Paul. And it sounds like even though it might be an internal conversation. They still have to be careful about what they say uh, because it could come back to bite them. Yeah. Yes. Thank, yes. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now when it comes to employment verifications, just like with education, more and more companies are using a third party to answer those questions rather than having to do it themselves. So when you terminate with an em employer, they may say, Here's a, a website, here's a phone number for Equifax or for Good Hire, whomever, and here's your ID number. When an employer that you go to wants to do a background check and they're going to do an employment verification, you give them this website or this phone number and your ID number, and they have to contact that company and get the information from that company. The downside is, Quite often, those companies are now charging for you to, for them to give out the information. So you may go to the work number, Equifax, the work number, and ask for it. And they're going to say, yeah, give us $20, and then we'll give you the employment verification number. So it's getting really tricky as to who's doing what and how it's being done and what it's costing, as you alluded to earlier, Christine, yeah. it's getting very expensive to do a background check and do it right and do it well. And yeah. so the opportunity for more misinformation is getting greater rather yes. than less. Yes. Okay. So any further questions that anybody has on anything we've talked about so far today? I don't have anything in the chat box. Does um, anybody want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Here are some upcoming presentations that I've got, um, and you're welcome to attend pretty much any one of them. Um, SHRM NYC may require that you be a member of their organization, but I suspect that if you wanted to attend that one and you let me know, I could probably get uh, presenter's privilege and, and get you access without any problem. Um, Lehigh Valley, I believe, is actually going to be in person. Uh, I'm waiting for verification on that. Um, but the rest of them should all be virtual. Um, and if you want to look at the project planning one tomorrow night, I would love to have you come and join. Just be aware that GAMIC stands for the Gay Activist Alliance of Morris County. Um, and so, um, the primary audience will be LGBTQ, but the, the presentation is appropriate for anybody and everybody. And you, you know there would be no issue with you joining that presentation. Um, here are some support groups that I sponsor um, and all of them are very different from this one, right? So this group was presentation oriented. The uh, Professional Support Group of Morris County is also presentation oriented, but the rest of them are strategic peer support groups. The, the idea there is everybody gets equal amount of time to share what's going on in your job search, and then the group will brainstorm to find the resolution or the solutions for best practices based on your problem. So the Yojo Club meets every other Friday. It's for those people who are under 30 years old and really just starting out in their career. The Outstanding Careers Group meets the first and third Thursday of the month, and that's primarily for the LGBTQ community. Mars County Executives in Transition is really for anybody. The name Mars County is there because that's where it started, but anyone and everyone can join in there. And the supply chain professionals group is for anybody in supply chain or logistics that is looking for help and talking to other people in the same industry. Here's my contact information. And um, I will be sending to Christine the slides so that she can send them out to all of you. But more importantly, I would love to hear from you directly. So if you wish a copy of the slides, you can always reach out to me personally. Absolutely link in with me. 
Um, if you want to talk, I'd love to talk to you. You can go to Calendly and set up a, a 10 or 15 minute uh, appointment with me. And so I've got two last questions for all of you. I like to model behavior. And at the end of an interview, I strongly recommend you want to ask these two questions. So, Christine, what do you like about me as a candidate for this job? Or the your second honesty. question. I love your honesty and frankness. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and the second question I like to ask is, so, Christine, is there anything that you still need to know in order to move me forward in the process? Or, Christine, is there anything that would prevent me from moving forward in your hiring process? Anything that prevents me from being your ideal candidate? Those are the questions I want you to ask at the end of an interview. In order for me to improve my craft, I like to ask these two questions at the end of every presentation, and I'd love to get at least two or three responses to each question. So the first one is, what did you like most about this presentation? Or maybe put a different way, what is the one takeaway that you're taking from this presentation? And I would love to hear from two or three people. Uh, for for me, Paul, uh, it was just the, uh, the the breadth of information and the detail that you went into for for each topic, especially because, as you said early on, nobody's covering this. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any anyone else? Isn't that interesting, Michael? That nobody is covering this, and yet it's so important. And we're all going into this blindly, this whole part, a very important part of interviewing and no one talks about it. So thank you, Paul. Like, wow, I'm glad that you're talking about it. <laughs> Hi, this is Anna. I just wanted to add to that, Paul. Thank you so much. And like the other, um, uh, Michael was saying, no one talks about it. I know that it's so important for uh, job seekers, you know, with the interviewing and so many tools and resources. But this is also very important and thank there you. aren't too many people that are talking about this so thank you so much sure thank you um so i'll ask the second question is there anything that any of you would like to have seen me do different or better in this presentation and i ask that because this is the only time place or way that i get feedback to how well i'm doing in my job and so i i welcome any any criticism or critique that you might have. Paul? Yes. Oh, I don't know if you can hear me. No, no, I thank you for, again, like everyone else, thank you, it's a good presentation. Um, one thing, I like that a lot of times you were telling us what we could do. So you're, you're telling us what some of the issues might be that like, an employer's never gonna wanna tell you, this is why we didn't hire you, but it's good to kind of know, you could check out some of this stuff and kind of get an idea of, what maybe people are saying that they don't want to talk to you about. The one thing that maybe, I don't know if it's possible, but maybe you could have talked a little bit more about how we could be proactive about, we talked a little bit about reputation. Sometimes like, you know, I think everyone always tries to be polite, don't burn your bridges, but sometimes, um, I don't know, maybe a little more about that because sometimes I've learned that you sometimes have to gracefully get yourself out of conversations because sometimes you may not be the person saying anything negative, but people hear gossip and they attach things to you that you didn't even say. Right. So I, I think maybe just that too, to like keep people aware that just maybe just if, if someone's even mentioning a colleague, even if you're trying to say something positive, just step out of it, just move away quickly, gracefully get out <laughs> of the conversation and it. Um, so that, yeah, that was the only thing I had to add. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thank I will, you know, I will try I and that, do it. Um, both Paul and I could talk for over 30 hours about job search. Yeah. And uh, the thing that you are mentioning is more uh, personal branding than uh, background check. They all tie in together, of course, with the resume and the interview and um, all, all that stuff, because there are so many parts to it. Um, but you would be here for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely, if you see anything, any speaker about personal brand and marketing yourself, definitely uh, reach out and, and join that networking group to get some more information. We have regular speakers on that topic as well. So. And, and Rose, I used to do a lot more conversation around references in this presentation but because of all the changes that have taken place with COVID and marijuana and a few other things recently, yeah. I, I just ran out of time. 
we're already here two hours and I, I could go on another half hour if I added the oh, references like back in. Yeah. So, um, but thank you for asking. And we can always do another presentation some other time just about references and yes. employment verification. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, sorry. Um, if, if we could jump really quickly back to uh, social media that you said was very important nowadays. Um, I. I say it goes without saying, but it doesn't go without saying that you should really definitely have your accounts private. Uh, yes. But but my question is surrounding that, like if obviously 2020 was pretty hot button as far as politics goes, uh, and you always want to make sure that your posts aren't going public, but to quote unquote friends. Uh, I was just wondering if if people can see in, into your account. I saw like one of the bullets on one of your slides said, uh, they're not allowed to ask for credentials, but uh, what can people see uh, if if you have your accounts private, is is that safe enough or should you go in and just, uh, you know, delete some of the things that, that some of the posts that might be inflammatory <laughs> stuff? You, you know, the, if you've got things out there that you don't want out there, um, number one, start deleting it yourself where you can. But more importantly, you have to go back to the person who originally posted it and ask them to delete it. Um, and then it, even if they do that, you still also want to go back to the webmaster and ask the webmaster to remove any references to that from their website. Okay. But it's it's almost impossible to get those things done. Um, the best you can do is just to put more good stuff out there about yourself and stop, you know, making those negative comments that could be used against you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I I you know I personally um, try and do the same kind of a thing that a lot of people do, where you know my LinkedIn is wide open for everybody to look at and see because I want you to find me and I want you to use me as your career coach. But my Facebook is very, very locked down and private. And unless you're a close friend or family member, you're not going to get access to pretty much anything in my Facebook. Um, right. So, but even that can be be hacked, you know, or get worked around because if I post something and my friend reposts it or shares it, you know, now you may be able to find it by doing a search. Right. Right. Yeah, so I'll, I'll definitely check out all those search options and, and scour the internet for, for myself. Yeah. Worse than background checks, LinkedIn and um, its ability to um, share posts and comment and all that, it, it literally changes hour to hour, not even day to day. Yeah. Um, so what you could do might not be available tomorrow, yet there's something new or three things new. And it's really important to stay up on that. So um, all of this is addressed in both the, um, you know, all three LinkedIn uh, videos that are posted on YouTube, as well as guest speakers. And there are social media speakers that talk about what you can and can't do and how it's changed and morphed and um, the, the world is literally at your fingertips thanks to 2020, <laughs> so good or bad. <laughs> and, and Christine, um, just so you know, um, I can stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes if there, you and or other people uh, want to continue the conversation at all, I'm, I'm happy to do that, but I don't want you or anyone else to be held here if you, need, if, if you can't. I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Are there oh. any others? Last call? <laughs> well, I see Carrie was saying, should you have a LinkedIn account? I mean, some employers have asked to see it and why, why or why not? Um, and I answered, so, absolutely. Yeah, so... You know, LinkedIn is the go-to website to learn about people from an employment perspective. And so um, it can be a very powerful part of your personal brand. And I would recommend that you do have a LinkedIn account. Um, but I also would recommend this, and this is the harder part. You need to stay somewhat active on LinkedIn all the time. Don't Somewhat be active. Meaning. Yeah, right. So, so 
you know, a lot of people when you're unemployed, you know, you have a lot of time. And so you're on LinkedIn every day and you're maybe posting once in a while and you're maybe commenting, you know, on some things, if not every day, every few days. Um, well, that's really great. And then when you get the job, we don't see or hear from you on LinkedIn for another three years or five years until you need the next job. What that does is recruiters and others who now see your profile and see that kind of sporadic activity know, okay, you're looking for a job now because you're active again, right? So you want to be somewhat active, which could mean once a week you're posting something and once a week you're commenting on two or three things that you see posted. Um, I try and make it kind of a, a daily routine where I will spend literally 15 minutes, not one minute more yes. every day yes. on LinkedIn, posting or commenting on stuff so that there is a yes. consistent record of me doing things on LinkedIn. I agree. But, but don't spend hours, whether or not you're employed, do not spend hours on LinkedIn. It's a waste of time. And this goes to the personal brand of what you can do to counteract uh, your possible background check um, yeah. is promoting yourself in different ways by using LinkedIn in that positive light for your personal brand. So yeah, uh, yeah we have we just had a speaker last week about it. So we're we're constantly um, keeping you informed and up to date. But there's so many networking groups in this area. Um, thanks to Zoom, you can go worldwide, which is wonderful. So definitely check them out because there's a lot of information out there. Just take one step. Other questions? Uh, lots of thank yous. Thanks for the useful yeah. information. That's, uh, you know, seems to be a common thread. So this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. My, my pleasure. Well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate you coming and staying even later for all of these questions and comments and, you know, uh, inquiries. If you think of anything that you would, oh, I forgot to ask whatever, you know, feel free, reach out to Paul. I'm going to send you a follow-up email with the URL to this recording, as well as his contact information for emails and that kind of thing. So definitely feel free to reach out. I love Paul. He's great. Um, so, so giving, so kind. And he has a lot of great information for job seekers, as well as the book he wrote. So take a look at it. You're, you won't be sorry, I promise. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Enjoy the sun while we have it, <laughs> even if it's chilly. <laughs> take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.